Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening and welcome to the third webinar series of Applying Skill Acquisition in Different Domains. Movement and Skill Acquisition Ireland is comprised of Edward Collin, Philip Kearney, Ollie Logan and myself, Alan Dunton, and we are passionate about skill acquisition, coaching science and youth development. And we hope that by hosting these webinars, we're able to connect you with some of the leading figures in their respective areas. Uh, over our previous two webinar series run back in 2020, uh, you can check those out in, on our YouTube channel, MSA Ireland. And for those of you in the webinar this evening, if you could just please keep yourselves on mute. And if you have any questions to read, please pop those directly into the chat box. When the uh, presentation section comes to an end, we'll hopefully get those questions directly to our speakers. And for anybody joining us on YouTube, if you could just pop those questions in the chat box on YouTube as well, we'll try and get those across to our speakers. And with a further notice on that, I'm going to hand you over for the introduction to our speakers for today. So I am absolutely delighted to be welcoming both Katie Fitton Davies and James Rudd to our uh, discussion this afternoon. Katie is a senior lecturer in physical education and movement science at Liverpool John Moores University, uh, whose research focuses on motivation and movement development, particularly in young children. James is recently moved to a position at the Norwegian School of Sports Sciences, where he's a professor in pedagogy and movement science. Together, they bring a range of expertise in relation to how to enhance physical literacy, motivation and learning in young children to facilitate their lifelong engagement in sport and physical activity. Really excited to hear what you have to share with us this evening. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Katie and James. Well, thank you very much for the warm welcome um, and uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, talk about this webinar series. It's a great honour. Um, I think James feels exactly the same as well. I do, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, as, as I said, um, I'm Katie and from Liverpool John Moores. James is from the Norwegian School of Sports Sciences now, although he used to be at Liverpool John Moores, uh, where he was my PhD supervisor. <laughs> um, and we've been asked to uh, provide a talk on skill acquisition in primary physical education. And we've kind of subtitled this as a journey through theory and application. So just a bit about the content of uh, tonight's talk. Uh, we'll just have some brief introductions to both of us to give you a bit more context about where we've come from. Uh, we're going to ask the question, fundamental movement skills or functional movement solutions? Uh, we'll then present some information around the skill acquisition methods fostering physical literacy in early physical education projects, aka sample PE. Uh, and then we'll kind of uh, discuss a little bit about pedagogical influences on children, more specifically around uh, motivational climates, and uh, we'll have some reflections um, and discussion at the end as well. So just a little bit uh, about me. Um, as has been said, I'm a senior lecturer in physical education and movement science at Liverpool John Moores University. I got my uh, psychology degree back in 2010. And then I went back five years later to do my uh, master's sport and exercise psychology, could have completed my PhD at Liverpool John Bowes. Between uh, my psychology degree and my uh, master's degree, I worked in schools as a teaching assistant at one to one for about five years and really gave me kind of an insight into how primary schools function. And uh, I was a tutor for a couple of years as well. My research interests include motivation, specifically self-determination theory, um, movement, most competence and creativity within physical education. And I particularly have an interest in bridging the gap between theory and practice. I've included these two teams because one, they made me laugh and I, <laughs> I really enjoyed them. Uh, but also they kind of link into uh, aspects of uh, my kind of research experience and journey. Uh, so there are no bad kids, only happy little classroom challenges, um, which is kind of stems from my uh, teaching assistant role and also with the uh, co data collection on the sample PE project. Um, and uh, so you let your students choose their own partners. I too like to live dangerously. And that kind of ebbs and both towards uh, the autonomy, supportive nature of uh, self-determination theory within physical education. So, yeah, a little bit dangerous, but it's good dangerous, good chaos. <clears throat> So over to James, introduce himself. Thanks, Katie. Uh, so as, as Katie says, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, so I've recently moved to a professorship here at the Norwegian School of Sports Sciences um, with a 
focus on move, the move movement sciences and pedagogy. I have a physical education background, both in the UK, working in South East London schools. Then I moved to Australia and I spent time teaching there before undertaking a PhD. After a PhD, I worked on a number of projects, which were collaborations between Victoria University and the Australian Institute of Sport, before heading back to Liverpool John Moores, um, where I got to meet Katie and had a working with her for many years and she was an incredibly uh, or a brilliant PhD student for me and is going on to do great things and yes very recently in the last six months I've moved here to Norway so that's a bit from me. So I'm going to ask the question of fundamental movement skills or functional movement solutions to start. Okay yeah so I'm going to take this section here so I'm ask, I put this in here because I have shifted my thinking from fundamental movement skills. And if you look at my early papers, I talk about fundamental movement skills a lot. I now talk more about functional movement solutions. And I thought it was important that I, on a forum, I articulate why I've kind of made that shift. And that's why I want to do here today at MSA Island. Um, so fundamental movement skills, what are they? Well, they're really a list of skills which are believed to be fundamental to be a you to participate in lifelong physical activity and sp different sporting so if you can run you're going to open the opportunities in many different sports catching kicking jumping and we can put them into different um categories so we can see them all there so that's what fundamental movement skills are and there is good research in this area my problem isn't with the research or be at all it's just with how maybe we're categorizing it and maybe to find stronger associations with physical activity and others which we are finding some good evidence but there's some studies which aren't showing such a strong evidence but we maybe need to reflect on what is actually fundamental and that's what i'm going to do over the next few slides so Kate, if we can move on so i'm not the first one to challenge this term and it was actually this paper which really made me reconsider. So this was by Carl Neal back in 2019. I think I first read it, but it says 2020 there, so maybe it's 2020. But this is really what started to get me to move my thinking away from the word fundamental movement skills. I'm describing all of the lists of skills we see above. And there's from this synthesis and review, Carl kind of highlights a number of challenges for the current conceptualization. This was really, it's not clear on what makes a motor skill fundamental or not fundamental. And as such, as we saw in the last slide, many, many, many different uh, skills are being listed as fundamental. So nearly every motor skill is almost being, which is unique, is being um, linked as, as called fundamental. This is partly to do with no theoretical rationale or position, which is kind of underpinning this concept so which makes it hard to define and there's also that idea around that they lead learning skills out of context lead to um, you being able to play specific sports better um, while intuitively it sounds like obvious but actually there's very little empirical evidence that learning skills out of context can actually lead to skills being good at the sport itself so there's these kind of key challenges and I, I want to spend a bit of time then or uh, if we go forward again one slide Katie so let's deal with this idea of a theoretical framework for fundamental movement skills or movement skills and I'm going to take a complex dynamical systems approach okay so this idea of self-organization and really one of the revolutionary studies in this area was the Hulk, uh, Hacken, Kelso and Bruns model so the HKP, HKB model and we can all do it here, if we want, we can do it at home after, it doesn't matter. But the idea of this model, what they showed is this finger wagging exercise is, first of all, let, let's all try it. So we, we have our hands up like so, okay? And first of all, we're gonna move our hands in anti-face, like window wipers on an old car, okay? Nice and slow. And what I do, I'm gonna change the constraint. I want you to go faster, go faster, 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 go as fast as you can. Go faster, fast, 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 fast. And what you'll see, if you look at your hands now as fast as they can, they have self-organized into a new movement pattern. OK, 
Okay, they've gone into in into in phase. Okay, so why is that? What's happening there? What we see if we tap it once, Katie. We see there. It's called an attractor state down at bottom, but we see there here at slow space we have these two shallow wells um, on the left and right of a dug of a figure on our left hand side. Okay, we see the little circle dots there, and that's a shallow attractor state. However, as we change a constraint here, or it being temporal time or the speed in which we get faster and faster, that state becomes unstable and it is attracted to a a deeper well, a more stable state within our um, movement workspace. And that's what we see here now. So this actually, we can do that at a very fast pace, or we can do it very slow. It's a very deep attractor state. So we see that these converge into thing, and we understand that the movement skills is moving from states of stability to instability and so forth. All right, and part of us is trying to develop these attractor states and so forth. So let's go forward again, Katie, then now we've kind of looked at a theoretical rationale for coordination. What we see when we see this big long list of fundamental movement skills on our left-hand side, we see, well, are these all unique skills, okay, which need to be taught? And what we see then is from these um, coaching manuals, which we see all around the world, is we see kind of resources created which kind of teach you how to do these skills and teach these skills. So if we click Katie on the little um, blue screen, and they tend to look like this. Okay, is there sound, Katie? I don't know if we've got the, it, it doesn't matter, but there is sound on the actual video. But oh, I what, can hear it, but maybe it's because of my... Maybe. All right. Um, okay. No worry. You just press play and I can talk through it. Okay. So while also doing this video, what this uh, coach is doing, he's also telling, giving instructions about you mustn't move your back foot in front of your lead foot. Okay. And you must be onto your balls of your feet. So giving very specific instructions on the technical performance of this skill. Okay. Which again, it's good. Coach. It can be good support for someone learning it. But the question is, why are we learning this skill? And actually, is there another way? So if we go forward again, and this is a, uh, to the next one, perfect, thanks, Katie. So we see here, this is a mound just outside my new office window, actually. So it's um, on, there's a snow park, and on this snow park, there's this mound, a little hill. If we've gone for a walk around the beautiful lakes of, in Norway where I currently am, we've, we've, we've come to the end and we're, we're on top of this hill together. And I say, right, get down that hill as fast as you can. What will happen is you will start to run. And then as you run, you'll be attracted to a new step. You will become unstable because that's not a stable state based on the constraints of that uh, task. And it will move to more of a gallop type movement pattern, a new attractor state. OK, so we see, again, this idea of moving from stability to unstable. And this is what we're seeing in these different movements, the importance of the environment and potentially how we, we, we are moving to different functional movement solutions based on the task and the environment in which we're in. OK, moving from these different uh, stable positions, stable states. So if we go forward again, Katie. So what we start to understand is movement skills potentially here are not top down in the idea that if you learn certain things out of context, it will translate into others sense. We also understand it's, it's a relationship between performer task and environment and this transitioning between stable states. So in this embodies of a performer, what we're seeing is the intrinsic dynamics of the individual self-organizing. So that being the yeah, Anthropometry, so sort of a height, weight, muscular strength, flexibility, all these things coming together, self-organizing into an attractive state, so a movement pattern based on the task and the environment. And this is embedded. So it's embodied and embedded in the environment. So it just starts us to shift about, well, is Gallup, is it a fundamental movement skill or is it actually a functional movement solution based on the constraints? And it, then it questions how we should actually be teaching it. Do we need to give them specific instructions or can we create environments or use the environments around us which can also teach these skills in a more playful and fun way? Could we play a game of tag 
on top of that hill or around that hill? Would we see some of these movement patterns? It's just these are just ideas, but it's being resourceful in our environments when we start to think about this. OK, so if we go forward, Kate, to the last one, and then I'm going to pass back to you. Um, if that's OK. So this is and the final thing one Carl talks about here and something I've looked at a lot. And actually, I did my PhD on it is the idea of postural control and balance. So really, if we're going to talk about really what's the most fundamental of skills, it's our kind of fight against gravity. And actually, that's really important that we kind of think about in youth coaching, primary schools, especially, I often don't see gymnastics and these activities on curriculums anymore. And I see these more multi-skill approaches, but actually using gymnastics and activities like this is so, so important to support children's balancing. They can't balance as well as adults. If they can, they may look like they can if they have their eyes open and they stand on one leg on the spot. But if you ask them to close their eyes, okay, they will find it much more harder to integrate those different sensory systems. So doing gymnastics, doing blindfold games, doing these activities with young children will really help develop these stability postural control skills, which are fundamental for all of these movement solutions in which we need. So that's kind of one of my main messages I wanted to kind of get across today. Um, Katie, I'll pass back to you now. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, James. So um, what we kind of want to talk about now is the uh, Sample P project that uh, James and uh, Dr. Lawrence Fowether kind of started putting together back in 2017. It was a random a cluster, random control trial, uh, looking to improve uh, movement skills in disadvantaged children. So the uh, rationale being um, there's low movement competence in four to eight year olds globally. You know, it's not, it's not just in the UK, it's um, in, in the eastern and western hemispheres um, and low uh, socioeconomic status. Children have lower movement competence and more affluent peers. Um, and the literature also shows us that higher movement skills avoids uh, lower cardiorespiratory fitness and heavier weight status. And uh, movement leads to a good movement leads to good perceived competence, which is important because children, especially young children, are um, competence driven. Uh, so if they believe they're amazing at things, even when they're not, um, and that kind of keeps them uh, involved in the activities that uh, we're trying to kind of get them to 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 do. Um, early intervention is necessary to improve movement competence and sound children on positive developmental trajectories. And there is a need for experimental research to highlight the importance of movement competence on physical, cognitive and social emotional aspects of um, physical activity. Um, <clears throat> so this is what um, the sample P was trying to kind of, uh, kind of base itself on where it all began. Literacy. Um, so, the justification is that physical education is mandatory for primary school children, regardless of socioeconomic status. It doesn't matter if you're in a kind of a more affluent area or in a very disadvantaged area, all children have to go to school, and all children who go to school have to do physical education. So, it's kind of like this special time in the curriculum where um, children have that opportunity to to um, be involved in, in different opportunities for movement. Uh, most development research has advanced knowledge about the physical, perceptual and cognitive processes in movement learning. Um, but movement skills are reported to be low in Liverpool areas, um, early years children. And uh, PE curriculum should have a strong theoretical basis to support movement. And what we've kind of been seeing, um, especially, uh, well, throughout the, the sample PE project was our control schools um, who were allowed to, well, we were asked to kind of um, keep on with their normal PE curriculum. Um, we, we tend to see that there was a, a, a lack of planning. Um, there was more of a, a just getting them active uh, which is don't get me wrong is it is a good thing for that they need to kind of be active but it's you know physical education is more than physical activity and um, playing games you know we have to educate them through through movements uh, so the school context of uh, the PE uh, sample PE was um, government funded primary schools uh, they were ranked within the most deprived town for English population and they were all first year um uh, year one children so five to six um, who were in their first year of structured physical education so we wanted to get in there early um, 
within their kind of uh, defend, developmental phase when it came to physical education um, and start them on this uh, intervention. <clears throat> so James. Okay, yeah. So the first stop when we're kind of developing this um, program is people were like, well, why did you kind of go down the traditional motor learning route as well as a contemporary? And I think it's important to explore all these areas. But the primary reason for this was that's what we see the UK education curriculum is built upon. The UK, UK not just in PE, but the wider education is kind of this more cognitive view of science. Uh, sorry, cognitive view of learning. And that's what they've chosen. So then it's important for us to, to appreciate, respect that, and then test it and, and make this part of this programme. So the recent Ofsted review, I, I must admit, I haven't read it all at the moment yet, but I have had a quick scan. And uh, what I've seen is, is movement competence is the number one pillar for physical education, which I actually strongly believe it should be because we're educated through movement. It's the only subject in the curriculum you do. And it also takes this more cognitive view of how we learn movement skills, um, which aligns, again, Ofsted uh, Physical Education Research Review aligns with a wider Ofsted's policy around this idea that long-term memories consist of a range of schema. So this more cognitive approach to learning. All right. And that cognitive approach has been around in movement learning for since uh, Fitz and Posner's work and those back in the 50s and 60s and so, and, and so on. So, and, and they kind of highlight the importance of feeling mature movement patterns. And this is done through high quality instruction, practice and feedback. And I'm going to talk a bit more, but so we go on to the next slide, Katie. Um, I'll very quickly just give you a quick overview on what this cognitive theory is from, um, there's many different varieties of this, but this is just the basics. So it's but your, your sensory systems, so your visual, auditory, proprioceptive, kinesthetic, all those different systems, bring in information and your brains are incredibly powerful processors, far better than and more adapted to many of these supercomputers we have in many ways. Um, and so is our whole central nervous system. And what it does is it processes information and creates representations. It creates representations of what's going on and then a schema, which is stored in our long-term memories, works a bit like a file of facts. It's selected to make a response, and then the response is for movement execution. If that's successful, it reinforces, makes that representation we create a bit clearer for the next time, and we get better. So it's almost like a blueprint. Um, so, and I'm just going to highlight, it's a top-down approach, okay? And the other thing which is important to highlight here is movement variability, okay? So, but movement variability is seen as error in the system. It's something which is actually kind of limiting the processing, okay, during this process. So it's something as a coach or PE teacher or whoever we are, instructor in there, is we're trying to reduce, we're trying to squash this variability in the through children's learning. Okay, next one, please, Katie. And this is, again, so Fitz and Posner came up with a really strong, well, a strong model around this theory. And this was the idea that, well, how do we support learning? They were doing this in fighter pilots in the Second World War, but we see it quite often in coaching. So we see the cognitive phase it means in early learning, there's very little schema developed. So we've got to then create that. So that means a lot of cognitive processing is going on. OK. To support the learner, we give lots of prescriptive instruction at this stage to support them develop the basics of a movement. Once you go through that stage, okay, you can then start to bring in some environmental because they're not just focused on the skill, they're actually look, starting to look up and focus on other things. And then the final stage is when, you know what, they completely get it. They no longer need to look at the ball okay, or whatever the activities they're doing. They can actually focus just on the environment. So, Ronaldo running down the right wing. He doesn't need to look at all he can look through. That's the idea. He doesn't need to, it's at the autonomous phase. And, and we kind of see that. If we go forwards, Katie, we, we, we think of like a lesson plan we quite commonly see in physical education. We see these quite prescriptive instructions in the outcome of like the technical skills we're trying to develop and maybe the tactical awareness we're going to develop once the technical has been developed. So you start, you, the first part is like drill one will be very much to learning the schemas. Stand two two lines, chest passes. Okay, now let's break into threes. 
let's do a game of like uh, piggy in the middle, something like that. And then you go into the game. OK, it kind of follows this idea of schema development in many ways. Um, OK, Katie, we'll keep going forwards. OK, and this creates a very linear project, um, pedagogy where variability we see is kind of funnel, but we're trying to reduce variability and get towards a specific movement pattern. And there's some key characteristics based on not what you should do, just what you kind of fall into following this prescription this pedagogy, if we just kind of click through all these, Katie. So we see it's more teacher-centered because we're supporting the learner. Okay, we're giving them instructions. We're giving them prescriptive instructions and corrective feedback. So it tends to be more about us part parting knowledge onto them. And that's done through drills, repetitions, and then into a game. And we assess this work for kind of how well they've become proficient through these more of the next slide, through this idea of mastery of fundamental movement skills. Uh, if we pop forward, Katie. OK, and here you go. You can see here uh, children performing and we kind of tick off when we see each characteristic of a movement to see if they've mastered it. All right. So if we move on one more slide, Katie. I've got to. We're OK time wise. Um, OK, so recent empirical evidence really shows or tells us that variability or challenges this linear assumptions especially around variability, okay? We, a great deal of uh, motor control literature from Latash and many others, Standal, others, is highlighting that uh, CIFA as well, Ludovic, are showing that humans are, are highly versatile degenerate systems and they're adaptable, okay? There's many different ways. It's not just one way to perform a task. There's many different ways and we should respect and support that. So, but the linear approach as it stands, as I've explained above, there are newer theories which try to do this, but that's beyond the scope of today. But they, they don't account for this adaptability in movement, and hence we need a new theoretical framework. Just double-click, Katie, because there was a little video, but we won't worry about that now. Um, we'll just go forwards. Okay, so this moves on to when the second part of this was really to develop, come go, well, okay, we see this in the motor control literature, we need a different theory. So, or not a different theory, is there a different one? And yes, there is. This is an ecological dynamics theory. And this is the idea of ecological psychology and the idea of direct perception. I'm not going to go into that today because I'm, I'm ahead of the time. So, and dynamical systems, which I've covered. When these two things come together, one more click, KT, what we, what we see here is we start to understand the learner is a complex and adaptive and degenerate system, system in many ways. And they're afforded opportunities from the environment. And if people want to ask me more questions about that at the end, I'm happy to answer them because I know I've skipped over the explanation. Um, if we move forward, Katie. So variability is handled in a very different way from this approach. It's not seen as error in the system. It's seen as learning itself. Basically, it's seen as this kind of moving between, shifting between attractor states. So we see here, blue here, are our attractor states. So that potentially we set up a task and we go, right, off you go, let's do the activity. And we see children performing the skill, however that attractor may be an overarm activity or whatever the activity is. And some might be throwing it like this and like this. Um, and that's fine. But rather than being given prescriptive in this idea of delaying schema, what we're trying to do is perturb the current attractor state to help them developmentally on. And we do that by changing task constraints, all right? So by, again, we think of that hill example, we could maybe for a child who doesn't know how to gallop and that may be too steep a hill, we could find somewhere a bit, a, bit uh, a ramp which is less steep, et cetera. But we're trying to perturb, find difference, but let these movement fields come out naturally through more task constraints. The other key aspect of this ecological dynamics approach, or one of the other key, there's many, but we move forward, Katie, one more, is this idea of, non-linear learning oh yeah okay so just there that's ideas once they've had one attractive state we can create a new one but the other idea is this non-linear learning so as they are experimenting and we are nudging them to find to try to perturb create like i did with us a new attractor state we're, we're letting them explore and we're helping them explore that and we see these explored by these squiggly lines what we might see is a sudden big jump in learning 
Now that could actually be a promotion. They've got better at something or more, more functional, found a new functional movement solution. But sometimes it goes the opposite way. Actually, the learning can go down. It can go the way, not learning goes down as such, but we can see a dec- uh, performance may get worse. But we accept that because that's part of this variability and exploration as well. So we see this kind of non-linear pattern to learning. Okay, let's go forward again, Katie. And so nonlinear pedagogy, when we take this idea of variability being really exploring around anchor points or recurrent attractive states, we see, we first thing we do is we take the learner where they're at. We're not trying to get them somewhere. We're trying to help them explore around where they are. We're trying to manipulate constraints. We're trying to do that to stabilize and then unstabilize and create exploration, all right? So we're not telling them how to do it or what to do. We try to create external attention of focus. Why? Because it supports self-organization. And we step in to only perturb or stabilize. And and really quite importantly, and it works well, Katie, is that movement is functional and we accept it. Okay, Um, so it fits with the ideas of some of these motivation elements. But sorry, I'm going to let's move on, Katie. Okay. And then we have um, an assessment for this. We can't use for proficiency, so we use how many different ways can you show us? Okay, so how many different functional movement solutions do they have? And I will now pass back to Katie. And I'm sorry, Katie, I've gone on for a little bit. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> um, so kind of uh, go back kind of more to talk more specifically about the uh, the sample P project itself. Um, James has talked about the type of curriculums that were involved. So we had um, and I'll kind of come back to this um, in a couple of slides is that we had schools, some schools take part in the a linear pedagogy and some schools take part in a, in a non-linear pedagogy. But basically um, the whole premise of the uh, project was to improve certain outcomes. Now, uh, the primary outcomes included the using uh, the CGMD to look at these uh, fundamental or functional movement skills, who knows, um, from, from this point of view, um, and also uh, stability skills. And uh, the DNA, which or the movement assessment, which uh, James was just kind of briefly talking about there, where uh, children have to kind of create as many different uh, movements as they can um, over three different stations. So this looked at the motor proficiency, motor creativity. Um, and basically the sample P setup was that we had a uh, baseline measurement. So we looked at their motor competence, perceived competence, their self-determined motivation, executive function, self-regulation and habitual physical activity. They then embarked on a curriculum if they were in the intervention group. So they, uh, the, whether they were in the linear or non-linear group, they took part in five weeks of dance, five weeks of gymnastics and five weeks of ball skills whereas the control group um, went on with their usual uh, PE provision for the 15 weeks. Um, During the 15 weeks, we made observations. We went in every five weeks to capture a PE lesson for each class. We video recorded them and uh, to then to be able to kind of study at a later date for certain other outcomes, which I will kind of more specifically talk about um, towards the end of the the talk. We then went back and uh, took more... um, uh, conducted the assessments again um, and uh, we also uh, conducted the same assessments again or very similar assessments in the follow-up which was basically a year on from baseline. Um, so some secondary outcomes include the perceived motor competence where children have to point at which, short, which child they would relate most, most to. Um, we use the National Institute for Health toolbox which looked at executive functioning so look at inhibitory control, working memory and I can never remember the third one, James. <laughs> cognitive flexibility. That's it, cognitive flexibility. Um, then uh, the children also wore accelerometers um, to look at their habitual physical activity. And um, my pride and joy, which is the MAP PE, which I developed during my um, PhD, where um, I looked at uh, children's motivation through a novel uh, activity-based interview kind of uh, format for the children to really kind of dig into how they how they feel about physical education from a motivational point of view um, so we recruited 12 schools that were all in um, low SES areas they were randomly allocated into control ecological dynamics or information processing theory group we had 360 children all from year one and at follow-up they were in year two um, and as like I said it was a 15-week intervention where um 
the schools who were in the intervention were and randomly allocated into either a one or two pedagogically informed curricula that James gave an overview of. Uh, so this is very much a watch this space um, point in the in the project. Uh, the paper is under construction. Um, the outcomes paper is expected to be available in late uh, 2022. Um, however, James can give you some kind of preliminary kind of sneak peek uh, results. It's, it's too early really to tell. We've, we've just started to really get into the data, but this is just quickly movement proficiency. So what we can see is all groups we saw an improvement. Well, we see a time group interaction. So there was improvements over time, but zero there's baseline. The one, sorry, the bottom of the left, the, the figures uh, is post-test and then two is a follow-up. The green line is the non-linear. The blue line is the linear for um the two intervention groups surprisingly to us we saw for those technical skills our non-linear improved more than both our linear and control groups so we saw an, an, a bigger change over time even though they were not taught the skills like our linear group were they were more taught around as more adaptive behaviors um so and then we see in the diagnosis Divergent movement again, we see the non-linear group outperforming of seeing a larger change than our control group being the orange lines and our linear group. But as I said, we'll be a far more detailed uh, presentation of these results in the paper, which will come out before Christmas. OK, so <clears throat> I kind of um, now I'm going to talk about a little bit about so how does what you say and what you do influence children and this kind of dug into one aspect of my uh, PhD um, on and which was embedded within the project so this was really looking at that kind of part of the process evaluation you know what was actually happening during the intervention itself when we went in to observe um, the uh, the different PE lessons so um, we were looking at the influence of pedagogy on three aspects, the motivation, physical activity and cognition. And we're going to just concentrate on uh, motivation for today, although we all kind of mentioned physical activity and cognition afterwards as well. So basically, um, the main underpinning theory was self-determination theory, uh, which posits there are three universal psychological needs, autonomy, competence and relatedness, and suggests that these must be ongoing if people may people to maintain performance and well-being and um, so autonomy is uh, we all need this sense of control and, and um, uh, choice uh, competence we all need to feel that sense of um, effectiveness in our environment and relatedness we all need to feel uh, a sense of belonging and connectedness um, with others so though these needs are hypothesized to be inherent in all in all students they exist as unrealized latent potentials that require supportive classroom conditions for their satisfaction and this is not true just for students but it's for all of us you know we all have these as latent variables within us that means that they're all they're, they're in us but that we need the supporting social environment to help them to be satisfied and for us to then be able to have those more kind of um, positive outcomes as a consequence so this links into a paper that came out uh, for one of, one of my papers that came out last year which looked to investigate to what extent do 2p curricula being uh, ecological dynamics and information processing theory underpinned by motor learning theory unusual pe practice support the emergence of empowering and disempowering motivational climates so kind of very briefly um, on what empowering and disempowering actually means. Uh, empowering promotes the feelings of autonomy related to some structure, which structure is linked to feelings of competence. Um, you have task-oriented perceptions of competence, whereas disempowering is when you, um, if you act actively thwart feelings of autonomy and relatedness, you promote ego-oriented perceptions of competence. Um, so what we did was um, we went in every five weeks to um, record these PE lessons. Um, we, in the end, recorded 45 PE lessons with a, a stationary GoPro and the coaches wore radio mics. Uh, we conducted a pedagogical fidelity, which was just to check whether what we were hoping was being delivered was being delivered. And 44 of these PE lessons were coded um, using the multidimensional motivational climate observation system. Unfortunately, we couldn't code one of the PE lessons because there was a microphone malfunction. Um, so basically, uh, we then coded these 
P lessons uh, according to this model underneath here. So there's two layers, layers of coding, an overall hierarchical and paramotivational climate, which is underpinned by autonomy support, task involving related supporting and structure. And these are all kind of coaching characteristics. Um, or a hierarchical disempowered motivational climate, which are underpinned by controlling, eager, involving, and relatedness, supporting um, coaching characteristics. So the main findings were um, from these observations in coding that all groups were low in the provision of overall disempowered motivational climate, which, are, which is a good finding, um, really, that uh, during year one PE, across all the groups, whether it be ecological dynamics, information processing theory, or the um, the control groups, was that they were all low in their disempowered motivational cl climate. However, ecological dynamics was significantly less disempowering than information processing theory and control groups. Um, the ecological dynamics provided significant more autonomy support than the control and information processing theory. So the children in the ecological dynamics had more opportunities for um, control in their own um, PE lessons for more choice as well. Um, however, in the information processing theory, um, they had more structure than the control and ecological dynamics, um, which meant that children had a bit more kind of um, structured like guidance um, throughout the whole lesson. And um, they had like a more kind of prominent overview of, of what the lesson was actually going to be. So the implications of this was that PE teachers should apply a pedagogical approach to their PE lessons in comparison to a, a multi-skills approach. PE teachers should provide opportunities for volition and choice in their lessons, but should be mindful of, of its application in accordance with children's skill level. A PE teacher should provide structure where possible, but should do this in an autonomy supportive way because we don't want to kind of clamp down and be too controlling in that, in that structure. So um, Dr. Matteo Crotti, another one of uh, James's PhD students, he was looking at physical activity um, of the children in the sample PE project, and you can find out more about this in, the, uh, in this paper. Um, and Laura O'Callaghan, um, in the process of getting her PhD, she was looking at the intercognition of children in the sample PE project, an example of how pedagogical theory can influence cognition can be found here. And definitely watch the space for more information. This is an area that seems to be really picking up pace um, for, from the more kind of the executive functioning uh, point of view. So just kind of a few reflections against reality. Um, really, this kind of meme again kind of epitomizes what it felt like to be a PhD student on the sample PE project. And I think a lot of kind of PhD students have very kind of similar feelings. Like, wow, you're sure good at juggling. How do you like a couple more balls? Like, yeah, okay, you know, let's just like juggle a few more things. But in reality, this was actually a really good thing and really set me up for, for the kind of hopefully the rest of my career. So I was the first PhD PhD student on the on the randomized control trial. We then got two more plus some more kind of on board as well. It was a little overwhelming. Uh, the project got, you know, it was already quite you know a, a quite a big project but then it kind of grew and grew and James kept bringing more and more people onto the project and I was like James stop bringing more people onto the project because I'm not going to have anyone to examine my <laughs> my PhD if you keep bringing people on um but I was really lucky in the support that I got is the PhD is a really daunting um a kind of time um, in your in your life and I was very lucky to have the the, the quantity of support that I had for kind of globally from James the people that James were bringing onto the project but also the quality of support in there as well um, I helped develop the ecological curriculum with James and the others uh, and this was a bit of like barking into the unknown really because it had kind of been theorized a lot at that point but practically there was only one group other group in the world I think James that was actually looking at this from an experimental point of view and actually implementing strategies um, to be measured um, and then we had to kind of create this uh, bespoke training course for the coaches as well so that we could kind of support them in delivering um, uh, the, the linear and also the non-linear curriculum um, with any kind of uh, project there's change of plans especially when you're working with schools you kind of have to really do it on their terms and that's absolutely fine um, uh, but you have to be really dynamic and flexible to be able to kind of deal with with that um, and teamwork makes the dream work you know we had a lot of people involved but it also is a double-edged sword it means that you know the, the the rule is that the more people you add on the longer things take but you know it's it's um it was lots of lessons learned throughout the whole project um, and definitely a lot of learning as you go you have to really kind of be uh, comfortable in being uncomfortable um, as a as someone on a on a project of this size but this is like kind of kind of kind of 
reality of of working on quite a large randomized control trial on on a, on a shoestring, wasn't it, James? Really, it wasn't. It wasn't massively funded. Uh, it was something that you know it was all kind of a labor of love from everyone in, involved, really, to put a lot of time into this. So um, yeah, a big thank you. <laughs> I just say quick on the reflections, Katie, just, yeah. just to echo what Katie said, but without those people, so Dr. Lawrence Volweber, so he was instrumental in the design, for design the measurements, um, helping to really help bring in people, other people as well. And, and you know what? We don't always all agree on everything and we may not always believe in elements, but we always are very respectful and we always try to just aim for to do the best science we can and support each other. And that's what we've done. Um, yeah, so we're all still very much on talking terms and like we're now <laughs> pushing forwards to get the final products. And we've had independent people in to do the statistics and these elements and the findings and the findings and we'll interpret those the best way we can as a team. And that's really important. But thank you very much. And yeah, K- Katie was instrumental to this project. Like, so well done, Katie. Thanks, you. Thank you uh, very much, both of you. I think really, really stimulating there, both in terms of the content, but also, uh, Katie, really nice to hear your reflections on you know, from your perspective as the student through. That was really useful to hear as well. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat already, so we might start with those straight away. Uh, Peter, I think you should be good to unmute if you want to jump in and ask your question yourself. If anybody else has questions, by all means, please drop them into the chat and we can call on you if you're able to come on your mic. Uh, over to you, Peter. Uh, hi, guys. Look, thanks a million for that. Uh, that was awesome, especially from a, a primary teacher's perspective. So. Um, there was a couple of questions that I just wanted to ask. So at the moment, the fundamental movement skills is taking place, um, I suppose, hugely around Ireland at the moment. And there's there's many seminars, I think, for the last four years that have been delivered in terms of starting off with locomotor, then stability, manipulative, and at the moment, it's motivation and confidence. So I was just wondering, based on what I've listened to tonight, um, would you recommend to any primary school teacher in terms of PE that maybe to start more with sort of games involved in your lessons, you know, because traditionally we would have maybe a linear approach and within those games, maybe uh, at certain occasions, um, pointing out some technical advice, okay, that some children might uh, benefit benefit from in order to improve uh, in the games themselves. And secondly, that is balance in your opinion, key to try and include in every single P strand if possible. Great questions, Peter. Katie, do you want to go first or would you like me to? Oh, you can go first. I'll pick up any pieces at the end. <laughs> no, no, thanks, Peter. So I'll start with the second one around uh, balance. So, yeah, I think we can, it is important. It's there in every skill we do, any functional movement solution. We need to be balanced. We, we are being perturbed in this idea of stabilisation. So it's, it is very key. Um so lots of lots of different activities which are going to kind of, especially in young children, perturbing this. So I think blindfold activities are very good if you can find a safe way to do it. Why? Because you take away the visual information and they have to integrate other sensory systems. So potentially like the vestibular system. So you put little children on rides. Okay, they feel it far more than adults, and that's because in the inner ear there's this kind of little liquid and it's more fluid than it is. So it helps to solidify that over time. So doing like cartwheels and all these climbing trees hanging upside down, all these types of activities. So, but build them in, like, as I say, postural control isn't such a skill on itself, it's within every skill. So building it into activities and being resourceful. So if you have benches in the hall, foam blocks and different things, it's the biggest thing from this kind of approach It's one, it's being resourceful with looking at your environment going what are the constraints do i have to always do my p lesson in a hall or could we go and do it on the mound up in the playground or around the ground so you can think of a different environment you can take them to where they're and naturally going to come across so that's one thing the, the second point around kind of instructions again yeah you, you bang on we set up games and activities and then but rather than saying like oh bring your arm further back or do this you might go, can you show me a different way? Or 
how about let's go stand over here and do it or well, now let's partner up and try because that way you're using other children and other things as task constraints okay they have to then explore around those so it's always kind of idea using variability and exploration sorry james just on that we we'll say sorry if i'm hogging a little bit but uh, when you say, can you find another way to, to do that as well? So at what point uh, would you give them maybe correct technical advice after they've, they've explored? Uh, well, the idea is what you're saying is when you say, can you show me different ways? It's stable. The movement is they're in this attractor well. Every time they come, they're doing the same thing. Okay. All right. So that's now we're not trying to. You can say to him, you could try Sean Cope, like, I want you to do it this way this time. You'd be very direct. And that's fine. You can do that. However, you're taking away that exploration of a variability. You're kind of forcing them to it because you're doing that based on, well, I don't, you may be putting yourself in trouble, which is a good way to do it. But then there's also, you may be thinking, well, that works for me. But you're six foot, but you're different anthropometrics. First of all, give them a chance to find their own solution to it and that's that's important okay thanks man no problems so i'm just keeping keep an eye on the chat if anybody else questions just drop them in but i've got a couple of questions which kind of build off of that a little bit um and the first one is you know there might be lots of individuals listening into this or watching the recording afterwards and you know, thinking okay this is really nice but I'd like to I'd like to see more examples, more practical examples. That's one of the things we always see out of the time from uh, teachers and coaches you know, to give me some more inspiration as to how to do this. Um, for me, recently, the Move Well resource that was created in New Zealand, I think, is, is really nice. It addresses some of what Peter was asking about there, about more of a game based approach to, to fundamental movement skills and this emphasis on exploration and interacting with other children within the, the, the resource or within the, the learning environment. Um, are there any particular resources, James? Because there, there are loads of resources, as you pointed out at the start, that show these are, this is a technical model and these are the cues that I want you to look for. There's loads of resources on that side. Do you have any recommendations? Have you anything that you would point towards to help individuals get a, more of a feel for what they might do? Um, there's not a lot, great deal out there around this at the moment. I Maybe me and Kate at some point and the rest of the team, we can take some of the sample PE and we can put that into a resource. I think that'd be a really good thing for us to do at some point. Um, the other, I guess the other people like Ian Renshaw is very practically driven. He does lots of really great stuff around this. Jay Chow in Singapore, they've created some resources and some videos. So that when Kate was saying there's one other group exploring this, that was Jay Chow and the Singapore group. Um, and then actually the Boyne Kids work of Danny Newcomb and Will Roberts, again, doing some nice ideas around this as well. So those are the ones at the top of my head, I would say to people. And I know Ian's created it's a constraint led collective, um, which has got. So, yeah, that would be some places to start. And yeah, maybe we can write this into a little activity book at some point, Katie. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think that would be great. I think, uh, and I'll, I'll dig out the link to Boyne Kids and I'll pop that in because that's definitely a really excellent resource with lots, yeah. of, lots of shared examples there as well. Um, Katie, I'm, I might just move to you again and, and just ask for a little bit more examples again is, is where I'm after. So you talk about, you know, the importance of autonomy for young children. You talked about giving them more control, giving them more choice. Could you just give us a couple of examples of how you would build that autonomy into the, yeah. the lessons? Yeah, I mean, the, when I say choice, it can be literally what feels irrelevant to us, but it is a case of, you know, them just choosing the ball that they they throw or kick or the colour, you know, it's, it's seemingly irrelevant choices for us can mean a lot to children. So it's something that you can kind of easily implement within your PE lesson. You know, you might be a bit reticent to kind of give full autonomy to the children and let them have full reign. And they, but um, to give them kind of certain levels of choice, you know, over that, you know, who their partner is within reason, you know, providing like rationales, you know, that's, you know, getting them to buy in, you know, you are the PE teacher and you are progressing them um, to, to the outcome that you would like them to reach. But how you get there is kind of between you and the children. It's almost like a negotiation in a way. But at the same time, 
you, if you justify and you provide rationales, even if it's just like a, a quick, you know, few words as to why are we doing this task? How does it link to, you know, the children and why should they care? The buy-in is so much more. Um, they kind of engage with it a lot more and it becomes more embedded and ingrained in them. And then the effort grows there and the persistence comes in um, and you'll see them kind of develop at a lot quicker rate than children who like have no idea what they're doing, why they're doing it. Um, so there's kind of little techniques that you can do um, providing opportunities to kind of uh, group work with other people I know this does you know happen a lot in physical education and in coaching you know pair work group work um, but then it's kind of but it's not just that it's going beyond that and kind of having that very inclusive feel you know it's a safe space to explore and to kind of experiment and investigate you know for a movement solution together and kind of having that kind of teamwork rather than kind of me versus you type situation that might happen on occasion um and then kind of just providing that structure as well like providing you know at the very start right this is what we're going to do this is how we're going to do it it gives children like a okay this is what we're going to do and like we know what, exactly what we're going to do and it kind of just gives them a like, little kind of streamlines lesson for them a little bit um so these are kind of just like little techniques um and if there we are kind of working on a resource to get these kind of techniques into one place for teachers to use um unfortunately I couldn't say when this would be available but it is in the works to happen um because at the moment the these techniques are kind of spread across different kind of research papers um there has been a massive paper recently out with lots of um teaching characteristics it aligned with self-determination theory and providing these kind of more empowering motivational climates but it's a really hefty piece of work that really needs to be kind of executive summarized you know for, for people to be able to just pick up and, and use so it's, it's it's ongoing work basically but there's plenty of stuff out there it's just hard work to find at the moment I yeah, know definitely look forward to seeing some of those resources come together uh, as you were talking it reminded me of, of some coaching with somebody from a military background and so I used to always contrast, you know, he ran a, he ran a Navy ship and I ran a pirate ship when I'm talking to six and seven year olds. And I stole that from a, an American uh, podcast. I can't remember, but I thought actually that that concept of a little bit of chaos is a good thing when you're dealing with that age group. I'm going to pass over to Alan Dunton, who's been looking to get in with a, a question. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, and thank you for the presentation, Grace. It's been absolutely excellent. Um, my question kind of comes off the back of the uh, hill that you had outside in Norway, James. And it's kind of based on something I've heard you speak about recently when you spoke about Chris Button's kind of open water and skill aquatics work. And it makes me question, do we need to kind of move towards fundamental challenges for functional movement solutions rather than trying to identify the movement solutions? So it allows more of that autonomy. And is that something where we should be moving towards more environment-based criteria and see the solutions emerge from there, or should we still stick with kind of skills and solutions? It's a great question. I think, yeah, you, I would. I think that's an excellent idea, Alan. Um, I do think we could move. I think safety is obviously a, a, a key one there. And why the, trend, the question of transfer is very challenging, like in skill acquisition generally, um i guess that's the, like some of these functional movement solutions will go across context but we don't know yet this idea of specific general is very complex but I, I love that idea i think it's a great one and i just say we're one other group i remember to have good resources phil and doing great work is the emergence group in america um yeah the, uh, tyler yerby and and richard white and sean mesker are doing some good work around this but yeah i love that idea alan yeah, can I ask just to because I know we're we're, we're closing in on time here. Uh, only the other day, myself and a colleague, Con Burns, got on a call with Mike Duncan in Coventry. Okay, and anybody who's in this in this domain at all will know of know of Mike's work. And and even he he was saying he said I'm moving away from traditional FMS and the TGMD and so on and so forth because we're beginning to see there's so much more that. You know, there's so much more under this duvet if we just if we look for all the different things that contribute to kids' movements and this biopsychosocial model and so on and so forth. Can I ask where you know why and how has it come that this movement is you know the thing that you guys are contributing to? Where is it coming from? 
And where do you see it going to? Like if, if, you know, in a dream situation, where does this end up having an impact and how, like, is it in the education of teachers, the education of coaches, the education of who, you know, where, where, where's it going to? As I said, if, if someone like Mike Duncan is already saying, we're kind of moving away from this and moving towards more functional stuff as well. And, you know, I'd be interested to know where this is going. Katie, you've worked with Mike. Do you want to jump in first and I'll maybe say? Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, I think it's, it's definitely kind of coming a, a, away from it. I think it's one of those things where it's kind of snowballed, where, you know, a few things. It's, this is, although it feels like a new concept, it's actually been around for a lot longer than we think. Um, but then it's kind of been picked up by momentum. I mean, James, I mean, what was it that drew you to it? You know, when it, you thought about the Sample P project, you know, what was it that kind of piqued your interest when you were kind of, what was it? <laughs> I felt uncomfortable with, I spent a long time assessing children use fundamental movement skills and I think about my own teaching and what feels like a good lesson and this kind of, when I was edu- educating and I, yeah, being a physical education, I just felt uncomfortable and I just kept exploring around different concepts and uh, kind of embraced that a little bit and went down a few rabbit holes. Um, I, I don't know, it depends. I think for instance, I'm in Norway now, and they have a very different view of education than the UK have. Um, and in that sense, I think they'd be more accepting to this approach we're going down. I'm not sure if the UK is ready for it yet, I, I think. But it's it's great. like Academics like Mike, who are very influential and doing so much good work, to be starting to explore this as well and these ideas is, is great. So I, I think just... For me, and I think Katie summed it up, that doing the sample was really hard and it was uncomfortable a lot of the time. We didn't know where we're going. It was scary and could have fallen flat on our faces. And many times we did in some ways. But that's what allows, allows us to keep pushing. So I think it's important to, yeah, to be that in your research and in your teaching. Um, now, you've got to be there's still you could still have something which looks like a very linear lesson in some ways Mm -hmm. okay exploration can happen is happening in a linear lesson like it is but it's very constrained so be mindful though also for constraints think about the school climate you're in the if you've got offset coming in what kind of lesson are they going to be looking for these things don't go too full into one way because it can get you into yeah so yeah so I if, I, if I can I in that regard so what does need to happen for us to get to fast forward 20 years from now when all of a sudden Ofsted are coming into your school or this the equivalent here in Ireland and they are looking for what we're, they're looking for more functional movement solutions rather than and they're looking for more um, you know autonomy supportive environments for the kids they're looking for more pirate ships than than naval ships what needs to happen for that shift to the, like the momentum that Katie speaks about is fantastic that that's led to where we are now in, in these little groups around the world and significant and all as they are. But as you said, when the powers that be will come, we're still going to want to put, uh, we're, we're currently in the place where we're still going to want to put on a very ordered, structured, linear type uh, lesson plan. And I'm seeing a lot of this in our own research here in coaching science. How do we move away from the shackles so that the shackles when they're off is the norm that we should be looking for what's how do we get to there? I, th- I think just keep educate keep exploring like there's the work i haven't even gone into is like the work of mark latash and motor control and variability i think we need to start maybe actually also stop speaking so much and i may be guilty of this with like ecological dynamics information processing we don't need to we can just talk about exploration mm-hmm. we can talk about variability we can mm-hmm. talk about these concepts which are important in all things and, and focus on let's understand these better. And then we can, yeah, we can move on. So maybe not quoting Gibson, dare I say quite as much and things and, and focusing more on what exploration is and variability and, and vice versa. So yeah. that would be, be one. And, and I guess the other is just keep like, I've, I've been incredible how many, like how much learning's going on now with social media and these other platforms it's great so yeah i i, I don't it's dynamic ed <laughs> <laughs>
Good. Yeah, Great. I think I think definitely is there's there's at least two prongs to it where you know we have to kind of continue this more kind of experimental research because one of the the things that started the sample P project was that there was there wasn't really any experimental research to go like, mm. well if we use this what's the outcome why should we care you know is, is this just another approach that's going to kind of fall by the wayside and why should PE teachers care but if we can then add to that you know um, experimental research pace and go time and time again show consistency that if you use this approach these good things will happen for your children these good things will happen for you as as a teacher as well yeah um, I think that's part of it, but also, yeah, the education part of it as well um, is the, then developing these re- resources to make more accessible to teachers. Um, I mean, I, I was kind of shocked during my PhD to find out that, and I don't know if it's still the case now, but uh, for kind of the general teaching uh, qualification, there was two days dedicated to physical education for P- for primary school and I was absolutely gobsmacked by that. I was like, how are they supposed to then take all, you know, two days worth of knowledge and then, you know, you know develop a whole curriculum when the curriculum does ask so much and there's very little in the actual national curriculum for physical education as well as if for England especially you know I don't, I'm not sure if Ireland has probably has a different one but um there was um, literally like one paragraph for it and it's like well how much guidance are we actually giving so it could, it could be doing a lot better for the teachers from from the day one um, but also needs to kind of provide more kind of accessible content for them and like James say using look people are using Twitter Facebook you know YouTube yeah. more of these online content uh, but also kind of making it more accessible to teachers after they've gotten to position you know into their positions as well yeah well said well said that is a big thing because we, we see it here in Ireland the, the, the resources what they get during their teacher training is it's almost laughable uh, to what we're then expecting them to go away and do with you know, five-year-olds right through to 12-year-olds in the primary school, or, you know what I mean? It's, it's incredible what we expect of them. I am just going to jump in on that excellent note. Uh, and being conscious of time, I would like to thank everybody who has joined us this evening. Um, thank you very much, James and Katie. If you could just hang on with us uh, as uh, we end the call, that would be great. Uh, and just to make everybody else aware that our next and final webinar of this series uh, with Dr. Rob Gray is going to be coming up on the 15th of this month at six o'clock. And just keep an eye on our social media channels for information on registration about that. Uh, and other than that, thank you very much for joining us this evening.